Yeah, I think um, in terms of practical impact, it's a little unclear right now. Electinib or Alicenza has been the standard first line therapy uh, for quite some time now, uh, following presentation for Jay Alex and Alex, those trials with frontline electinib against crizotinib. And those data uh, have looked great. And you know, as they mature, they continue to look great. Um, and that's been the standard of care for quite some time now for alpha-positive lung cancer patients. Um, there's no cross, there's no uh, head-to-head comparison between brigatinib and electinib. That trial's never been done. Um, and so we don't know um, which one is sort of better, which one should be selected over another one. And so I think from a practical standpoint for a, from a patient, it's unclear which one should be chosen first. Um, you could play sort of the exercise of cross-trial comparison, understanding that there are caveats to that, to try to make some kind of decision as to what to do. Um, and that is maybe somewhat helpful. You know, the, the PFS data in particular for electinib may be a little bit better by hazard ratio and median PFS than brigatinib. Uh, but at the end of the day, we just, we kind of don't know because we haven't done that head-to-head -head trial. They are both better, clearly, than crizotinib. Um, and so I think practically, uh, many of us will continue to prescribe electinib uh, because the experience with that has been so great in the past and because that, those data are pretty mature. Um, so we'll see. There is a second-line trial that's comparing brigatinib versus electinib that's being done. Um, and so that readout should be interesting uh, because if there's a signal that one is better than the other in the second line setting, that may um, end up informing how people operate in the first line setting. So I think that may be the closest thing uh, to data that might help clarify that situation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, practically, it's, it's a little bit uh, unclear uh, from a rigorous standpoint as to which one to use in the front line setting. Mm. So then in terms of just the, the treatment landscape in general, you touched on a few different options right now, but how does this approval kind of alter that treatment landscape for this subset? Um, it doesn't too much uh, insofar as, um, and that's what happens when you have really great drugs <laughs> uh, that are available right at the beginning for our patients. Um, and so it, it doesn't too much. It's another, you know, great drug uh, compared to what the old standard used to be. Um, what I'd say is that um, it does raise into question what we do at the time of progression for these patients. Um, and there's still a bit of a question with regards to that. You know, the, the sort of academic mindset is to continue to do um, bi tumor biopsies or liquid biopsy testing to look for secondary changes in ALT to try to guide therapy um, based on the sensitivities or specificities for these different drugs to these mutations. Um, but that can be hard from a practical standpoint. Um, and, um, and that requires a certain amount of um, a sort of knowledge that is maybe hard to disseminate and out into the community. Um, so it still raises that question as to how to navigate uh, those spheres. But here again, there are so many drugs that have been, proved, been approved in the second line setting and beyond that there are just lots of options. So it's, you know, it could be a matter of just picking one, seeing if it works and rotating to the next ones um, after that. It is worth mentioning also that standard chemo, even though it gets a bad name, is very good in this population also. Um, and that we've known for quite some time also. So even then, you know, the, the chemo option for these patients is, is quite good.